This lecture will go over chapter 33, Physical Assessment of Children. And this chapter is with the rest of the chapters that we're going to talk about. The information covered in lecture won't be all of the information covered in the chapter. So it's important that you listen to lecture and don't study the whole chapter if you don't have to, because we're going to pull out bits and pieces of information that's important. So let's start. As when providing any nursing care for infants and children, the nurse applies the knowledge of growth and development when preparing the child and parents for performance of the physical examination. Involving parents as much as possible in the examination and allowing the child to handle safe, clean instruments, such as a stethoscope, reduce anxiety, and increase the likelihood of examining a cooperative child. Establishing a trusting relationship between the child and examiner is important. Throughout the examination, the nurse needs to be sensitive to the cultural needs of and differences among children. Providing a quiet, private environment for the history and physical examination is important. The, classes, the classic systematic approach to a physical examination is to begin at the head and proceed through the entire body to the toes. However, when examining a child, the examiner tailors the physical assessment to the child's age and developmental level. First, we'll talk about infants from birth to six months. Infants aged birth to six months are responsive to human faces, are increasingly interested in their environment, and do not mind being undressed. Therefore, their examination should be relatively easy. If the infant is nursing or asleep in the parent's arms, auscultate the heart, lungs, and abdomen without waking the baby. Even if the infant is awake, effective examination can still be accomplished with the infant lying or sitting in the parent's arms or on the lap. As body parts are examined, incorporate evalu evaluation of primitive reflexes. Leave all uncomfortable procedures, such as abduction of the hips, speculum examination of the tepatic membranes, and elicitation of the moral reflex until last. Before beginning the examination, undress the infant, leaving the diaper on a male child. Refocus an unhappy infant by calmly talking in a soft voice, distracting with a rattle, or offering a pacifier. For infants from 6 to 12 months, follow the same procedures used for the infant from birth to 6 months, but keep in mind that infants 6 months and older feel stranger anxiety and so are more difficult to examine. Distract a child this age with a toy or an object can be useful. Leave ear, oral, and other uncomfortable procedures until last. Toddlers are the most challenging to examine because they are the least likely to cooperate. To form a supportive relationship with the parent and toddler, the examiner begins by sitting or standing next to the parent. To facilitate relaxation, the examiner can provide a few toys and books and encourage the child to explore. Allow the child to handle objects used during the examination. Um, this can help to, to decrease fears. Communicating with the child using age-appropriate words to describe what is about to be done can also help to decrease fear. The order of the examination is flexible, proceeding from least to most invasive procedures. Resistance and crying are common with toddlers. The nurse assures the parent that the child's response to examination is normal. The parent is, is the best resource for gaining the child's cooperation during the examination. The classic systematic approach to the physical examination is to begin at the head and proceed to the toes. For children, painful or frightening procedures should be left until last. Involving parents by asking them to hold or stand by the child can decrease children's anxiety and assist them in relaxing. Preschool children are usually more cooperative than toddlers, but still like to have their parents nearby. Preschool children are happy to show nurses that they can undress themselves. They can also be expected to cooperate. The nurse can proceed with the examination from the head to toe, but should still save the more invasive procedures, such as the speculum ear examination or the oral examination until last. The examiner can reinforce the child's interest by allowing the child to participate in the examination and by praising the child for cooperating. To establish trust with a school-aged child, the examiner asks the child questions that the child can answer. Children in elementary school will talk about school, favorite friends, and activities. Older school-aged children may need encouragement to talk about their school performance and activities. The examiner encourages the parent to support and reinforce the child's participation in the examination. The examination proceeds from head to toe. Children of this age prefer a simple drape over their underpants or a colorful examination gown. 
and the examiner should be sensitive to the child's modesty. Adolescents are most comfortable with a straightforward, non-condescending non approach. Decisions about who should be present during the examination should be openly discussed with the adolescent. In most cases, adolescents should be examined without the parent present. However, the parent should be given the opportunity to talk to the nurse about any concerns. The order of examination is the same as for the school-aged child. The physical examination provides the opportunity to assure the child experiencing puberty about normal developmental stages and to answer concerns children this age frequently have about what is happening to their bodies. The adolescent is expected to undress and wear a gown. The adolescent is draped appropriately during the examination. Here's just a little picture of a child uh, being assessed and you see the child's comfortable sitting on mom's lap so we want to keep them um, comfortable and that makes them less anxious about the examination. We're going to skip over um, techniques to a physical examination. You learn that in, fu in uh, fundamentals. Skip over percussion and move to general appearance. During the first contact with the child and parent, the examiner formates forms an initial impression by making a general survey. The nurse determines the child's age, sex, and race and identifies clues concerning the child's behavior and health status. During the general survey, the examiner continually notes the parent-child interactions and the way the parent responds to the child's needs and behavior. Physical and emotional neglect, as well as inadequate parental supervision for the child's age, can be subtle or overt. These observations, together with other indicators of the child's health status, can provide clues to distress or abuse. And you have a text in your box and here on, the, um, on your PowerPoint also, potential indicators of child abuse, inappropriately dressed or excessively dirty, dirty teeth, dirty broken fingernails, matted dirty hair, um, crouching in a corner, slow concentrated movements, being thin but describing themselves as fat, Answering questions in one word with in words with one syllable, looking to others to respond first, seeking approval for answers, looking fearful, anxious, tearful, sad, ang or angry expressions, demanding, bizarre, overly dramatic, condescending, or labile, meaning going from extremely happy and laughing to all of a sudden crying, um, sort of those fluctuating states states of emotion. Taking an accurate history is the single most important component of the physical examination. In the complete or initial history, data are gathered about the child from the time of conception to the child's current status. The well or interim history includes data gathered about the child from the last well visit to the current visit. In a problem-oriented history, information is gathered about a current problem. Milestones in growth and development, immunizations, and family status are always included in the child's history. Vital signs are taken for every child during every visit in ambulatory care settings and are monitored throughout the day in a hospitalized child. First, we're going to talk about temperature. The method for measuring a child's temperature varies from one setting to another. Some parents are comfortable taking a rectal or axillary temperature with a digital thermometer. Healthcare providers might use tympanic membrane or temporal artery sensors or an electronic digital thermometer. Currently, parents are encouraged to take axillary rather than rectal temperatures. Reasons for the recommendation are the invasive nature of rectal temperature measurements, the risk of injury, and their questionable accuracy in febrile children because of feces retaining body heat for hours after a, fe after a fever has diminished. Axillary temperatures, when taken correctly, provide accurate information concerning changes in the child's health status. Temporal artery thermometers frequently are used in the healthcare setting because they can accurately measure body temperature in infants and children older than three months and are less invasive and more time efficient than rectal or axillary temperatures. Tympanic temperature measurements can be used as well. When recording a tympanic temperature, the nurse notes the side on which the temperature was elicited. An oral thermometer can be used for older children, usually starting at five or six years of age. Apical pulse rates are measured in children younger than two years and in any child who has an irregular heart rate or known congenital heart disease. Radio pulse rate can be taken in children older than two years. 
to compensate for normal irregularities, the nurse counts the pulse for a full minute. The nurse observes the rate, depth, and ease of respiration in the child. Respirations vary with age. The respiratory rate, like the heart rate, is significantly influenced by emotion and exercise. In infants, the rate can be determined by observing abdominal excursion. In toddler and older children, the nurse observes thoracic excursion. Because movements are irregular, the rate should be assessed for a full minute in infants and young children. Respirations are both best counted when the child is not paying attention to the examiner. Respirations should be counted while the examiner continues to keep fingers on a pulse or stethoscope on a chest as though checking the pulses. This effort will ensure that the child is unaware that the examiner is counting respirations. Blood pressure measurements are taken for, for all children at every ambulatory visit. In an acute care setting, blood pressure is measured at least daily and often more frequently depending on the child's condition. The appropriate size cuff must be used in order to obtain an accurate blood pressure. The size of the cuff is important. Cuffs that are too small will cause falsely elevated values. Those that are too large will cause inaccurate low values. Table 33.1 has a, is a table there of normal vital signs per age. So if you look, the temperature, right, there's not huge changes in that one. Pulse rate, though, you can see the pulse rate of a newborn, 100 to 150, and it suddenly decreases as the child gets older. Same with respiratory rate. It starts out at 35 to 55 breaths per minute, and it suddenly decreases as the child gets older. On the other hand, blood pressure starts out lower in the newborn and get, increases as the child gets older.